Okay, well, good morning and welcome everyone. I'm sure you'll agree that last evening's program provided a terrific launch for this conference. Uh, great stories, elevated dialogue, and followed by a fascinating analysis of this election year. For those of you just joining us this morning, welcome and fasten your seat belts. We've got an exciting and very full day ahead of us. Last night we heard from Governor Rockefeller's political heirs. This morning we'll get further perspective on the governor from two historians, a political scientist, and a newspaper columnist. Our moderator doctor is Dr. Jay Barth, the chair on the on the right on here, up your left. He's chair of the Department of Politics and International Relations at Hendricks College and a leading authority on politics and the South. He's won numerous teaching awards and has worked on the staff of U.S. Senator Paul Wellstone. We're particularly honored that he made time to visit us because he's part of a marriage ceremony tomorrow, his own. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Jay Bart. Thank you, Christy. Good morning to everyone. And uh, if you're having difficulty, there are chairs up, uh, up in the front if, uh, if you want to move up uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, this morning is very much going to be a conversation uh, about uh, the, the legacy of political reform of, of Governor Rockefeller. And uh, there is a tremendous amount of brain power in this room, and we want to get everyone in this room involved uh, in, in thinking about uh, the continuing legacy of Governor Rockefeller. Uh, but to get things started, we have uh, three, uh, three folks up here uh, who, are, uh, who have thought a lot about uh, Governor Rockefeller and written a lot about Governor Rockefeller and his legacy. And, and uh, what's going to happen is that each of them will uh, uh, give uh, eight, ten minute opening remarks. Uh, and then uh, I'll ask a couple of questions just to get the conversation underway. And then I very quickly am going to turn it uh, over to you. And when we reach that point in the, in the uh, program, there are two microphones uh, here, uh, as if you were here yesterday, you saw. Uh, if you are able, please come to the microphone. Uh, and first off, tell us uh, who you are, uh, just so that that's captured uh, for, for the record. Um, I'm going to begin, uh, um, I'll go ahead and introduce everyone, and then we'll just uh, flow from there. Um, I'll begin uh, introducing Kathy Irwin, who is, uh, uh, was at the University of Central Arkansas from uh, uh, 1984 to 1999. And while uh, at the University of uh, UCA, she, com she turned her dissertation on Winthrop Rockefeller's governorship uh, into the first full-fledged scholarly account of that, of that governorship. And I think that, that she is a, a crucial person to be a part of this conversation because she really kind of laid the ground for, for understanding in a scholarly way what Winthrop Rockefeller meant as a governor uh, and what he meant for uh, the reform movement uh, in the South. And her book came out when I was in graduate school. I remember reading it right when it came out. Uh, and it really, I was working on republicanism in the South, and it really helped me kind of understand uh, why my home state uh, had a distinctive brand of, of republicanism uh, that was not fully uh, captured elsewhere in the region. Uh, so Kathy is, uh, left UCA in 1999. She uh, taught at Temple University for a while. Uh, she is now uh, the, on the administrative staff of the Princeton Ballet School uh, in Princeton, New Jersey. And so we're thrilled to have Kathy back in Arkansas. So welcome back, Kathy. Thank you. Um, next to my left, uh, uh, Dr. John Kirk is the chair of the history department uh, at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, uh, where he has been for uh, two years, a year and a half. Uh, John uh, has written widely on uh, Southern political history uh, and the politics of race uh, in the South. And a real recurring theme for him in his work uh, across the years uh, has been the fascinating politics created by uh, Winthrop Rockefeller in Arkansas, uh, politics both in the electoral arena uh, and then in, uh, in the way in which he did govern, which is, of course, the, the focus uh, today in many ways. And so welcome, John Kirk. And then finally, John Bromet, uh, who has uh, been an observer, of course, of Arkansas politics uh, for, for many years. Um, and uh, John uh, has recently, as many, most, if not all of you know, has returned to the Arkansas Democrat Gazette uh, as a regular columnist there. And so he uh, has, of course, been a columnist in, in a number of settings uh, throughout the years. Uh, he is, of course, a, a, a writer about Arkansas politics, 
uh, and the politics of Arkansas politicians, including his, his book, High Wire, on the, uh, President Clinton's first year in Washington. And John is a gifted uh, writer in a lot of ways, but I think his greatest gift, I would, I would argue, uh, is his ability to link history to what's going on today. And that is a, r a real gift in a columnist. And what John brings today is thinking through uh, what, uh, what happened uh, in the late 60s and early 70s and what it means uh, for, uh, for uh, reform politics in Arkansas. So welcome, John Brother. And so I'm going to be begin with Kathy. OK. Um, please excuse me. I'm going to read my opening comments, because otherwise I'll forget half of what I wanted to say. But um, first of all, a lot of what I think we're all going to say today is going to mimic in some ways most, a lot of what was said last night. But Rockefeller's primary importance in the history of Arkansas politics lay in his serving as a bridge between the Faubus machine and Arkansas's modern Democratic Party. While he was the first Republican to be elected governor in the state since Reconstruction, he did much more for the revitalization of the Democrats than he did for the Republicans. Rockefeller's victory in 66 resulted from a variety of factors, an opponent in Jim Johnson who was an unabashed hardcore segregationist, the elimination of the poll tax and sub Rockefeller's subsequent garnering of more than 95% of the African American vote, and urban, moderate, and liberal Democrats who couldn't stomach the Democratic candidate and wanted to move the state past Central High. As governor, Rockefeller fought for governmental and societal reform, while his success rate waned as his term in office lengthened, he achieved more than could be expected, considering the legislature he dealt with consisted of 35 Democrats in the Senate and 97 Democrats and three Republicans in the House. Uh, furthermore, thanks to Rockefeller's deep pockets, many of these Democratic legislators had faced opposition in the general election for the first time in their lives and therefore the expense of a second campaign, which they weren't used to. So there was a lot of resentment there. In education, Winthrop Rockefeller fought for and won free elementary school textbooks, the right of school districts to create kindergartens, though he failed to get state funding for them, and teachers' raises. He was unsuccessful in enacting a teacher tenure bill, free high school textbooks, or teacher raises high enough to be considered a living wage. Um, he, acting on a lifelong aversion to gambling, he cracked down on e illegal gambling in Hot Springs through the use of the state police, and he blocked efforts to legalize gambling there. Of much greater importance to Hot Springs and other tourist areas was the passage of his mixed drink bill, permitting the sale of mixed drinks where it was approved by the voters. Um, as Senator Bumper said last night, the Rockefeller administration began the streamlining of state government through the new Department of, of Administration. It was the Bumpers administration that followed through on a much more extensive cleanup of the structure of state offices. He did pass a Freedom of Information Act. The state's first minimum wage law was resulted from Rockefeller's efforts. It trailed the federal minimum wage by 30 years and excluded a large percentage of Arkansas's lowest paid workers, but it was a beginning. Um, prison reform. When Rockefeller took office, Arkansas's prisons were violent work farms guarded by armed prisoners. Somebody asked me last night what a trustee was. It was an armed prisoner entrusted with the power of life and death over their fellow inmates. Vocational and rehabilitative training did not exist. Prisoners suffered from a poor diet, inhuman conditions, and corporal punishment that did not just border on but cross the line into torture. Rockefeller started Arkansas's prisons on the road to reform. Corporal punishment was eliminated, sanitation and diet were improved. A lack of funds prevented the complete elimination of the trustee system, but the prisoner staff ratio went from the worst in the nation, 58 to 1, to 8 to 1 in 1970. Racial segregation ended, replaced by segregation based on age and severity of the crime. Vocational training in high school classes <clears throat> began. The prisons were still considered by a federal judge to be cruel and inhuman punishment, but reform continued under um, Governor Bumpers. Rockefeller's prison reform agenda culminated with his 11th hour commutations of the sentences of all 15 men on Arkansas's death row. The commutations took place after his unsuccessful third term bid. 
During Orville Falbus's 12 years as governor, 16 men had died in Arkansas's electric chair. Shortly after taking office, Rockefeller dismantled the chair and placed a moratorium on executions. When he left office, the Supreme Court was still deciding the constitutionality of the death penalty. And so he commuted the sentences um, as he said at the time, I cannot and will not turn my back on lifelong Christian teachings and beliefs merely to let history run out its course on a fallible and failing theory of punitive justice. The commutations were probably the most personal of his actions in office, reflecting his own personal philosophy, but they did have an effect on his successors in office. The Supreme Court reinstated the death penalty in 1976. Arkansas was the last southern state to execute after anyone after that, and the first execution didn't take place until 1990 under then Governor Clinton. Um, his achievements in the area of civil rights have been discussed already at, at great length, and they were substantial, but in some respects intangible. Um, he came to Arkansas already an active member of the National Urban League, a firm believer in equal opportunity for all. Um, civil rights had been in Rockefeller's family for generations. Spelman College is named after his maternal um, grandmother or great-grandmother. In the context of the 1960s, though, he was not a liberal. He opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, branding it an unnecessary expansion of the federal government. He believed in volunteerism, example, and persuasion rather than coercion. Once elected, he worked to increase black participation in state government. He oversaw the integration of Arkansas's draft boards and, whenever possible, appointed African Americans to state boards and commissions. When the legislature refused to establish a state human resources council, he created one by executive order. Um, Sonny Walker became the first African American department head in the state in 1969, when Rockefeller headed, named him head of the state um, OEO. But he did much more to promote racial equality in Arkansas than the numbers indicate. As it was said, he stood on the steps of the state capitol after Dr. King's assassination and sang We Shall Overcome. He consistently met with spokesmen for the black community, attempting to work out compromises. He acted in a manner that was as colorblind as possible, and that didn't pacify either side, but it reflected his own beliefs. His one major apparent lack of courage in that respect came during the 1970 election, when he backtracked on his position regarding busing. He probably could have accomplished more had he been a better politician, better able to glad hand the legislators. Um, but the legislature never forgot the fact that he was a multimillionaire from New York, and I think the two sides never completely understood each other. He fought desperately to create a two-party system in Arkansas, and I would argue that at the time that he failed. Um, today's Arkansas Republican Party does not owe its electoral successes to Rockefeller's legacy. His elections were personal ones and were in no way indicative of growing Republican Party strength. Philosophical differences between Rockefeller and many state Republicans always existed. These differences were exacerbated by the controversies that arose over the governor's appointments. Resentment grew whenever he appointed a Democrat to a state board or commission, but appointments of Democrats were necessary given the makeup of the legislature and the dearth of qualified Republicans. Rockefeller's elections forced the Democrats to reform their own party, and when they did, the voters willingly re returned to that fold. The um, political platforms in 1970 were almost exactly the same between Rockefeller and Bumpers. And the Arkansas people said, quite understandably, we're tired of all the fighting, he can't get anything through the legislature, we're going to go back to the Democrats. Um, what Rockefeller did for the Republican Party in Arkansas was to give birth to the idea of the party as a competitor for votes, rather than existing slowly for patronage. <clears throat> but the current Republican Party in the state, I believe, owes its successes more to philosophical and cultural shifts, both internally and, in, and nationally within, that arose during the 1990s, not um, to Rockefeller's victory. In 1989, Senator Bumpers told me, if there had not been a Winthrop Rockefeller, I am not sure there would have been a Governor Dale Bumpers, a Governor David Pryor, or a Governor Bill Clinton. His victories in 66 and 68 were part of a regional increase in Southern Republican election successes, but his winning margin came in large part from urban liberals and blacks. 
Most other Southern Republican office holders were conservatives who owed their victories to white backlash to the civil rights movement. And Arkansas voters were never averse to voting a split ticket between national and state elections. In 1972, two years after he left office, <coughs> excuse me, Richard Nixon garnered 69% of Arkansas's votes in all 75 counties. The Republican gubernatorial candidate for that year lost all 75 counties and received 24.6% of the vote. Arkansas's Republican Party was in voting strength back where it started. Winthrop Rockefeller was more conservative than his brother Nelson, but he was still a Rockefeller Republican, one of a dying breed of Northeast Republican Party elite, fiscally conservative but socially more progressive, heirs to the legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. He and the post office Republicans of the old Arkansas Republican Party never understood each other and formed only a temporary uneasy alliance. When Rockefeller left office, the state Republican Party moved along a much more conservative path. Um, Rockefeller was unique because his ambitions were not personal. They really truly were for his adopted state. As a result, Arkansas government became more respectable and responsible. Given his own personal shortcomings and all the difficulties endemic to Arkansas politics, he accomplished a great deal and his governorship was a watershed in 20th century Arkansas political history. Thank you, Kathy. John Kurt? Yeah, I'll turn on. Um, as Jay said, I arrived in Arkansas to take up my new position as Donaghy Professor and Chair of the History Department uh, a couple of summers ago. Uh, and for 12 years before that, I taught at the University of London, and most of my time has been spent studying Arkansas history from overseas. Um, I started my PhD thesis on the Civil Rights Movement in Arkansas almost 20 years ago, so I've been coming backwards and forwards to the state during that time. And that uh, was published in 2002 by the University of Florida Press, and I've published extensively on the history of civil rights and race relations in the state. But that progress sort of brought me onto Winthrop Rockefeller, who, as we've already said, played an important role in race relations. And before I moved to Arkansas, I spent two month-long stints as a scholar in residence at the Rockefeller Family Papers, uh, Family Archives, that are up in Tarrytown, New York. And they have copies of the Winthrop Rockefeller Papers a microfilm there. And uh, since moving here, of course, the originals for the Winthrop Rockefeller papers are stored at the UALO Center for Arkansas History and Culture uh, in Little Rock. So I've been working on the original papers there. And the goal and ambition is to write a wider biography of Winthrop Rockefeller. Kathy's written a great book on the governor years, and John Ward, of course, has written a couple of great books on the Arkansas Rockefeller. But I've also been looking at Winthrop Rockefeller's 40 years in New York City before moving to Arkansas, which I think are an important context for understanding Rockefeller and what he did in Arkansas. So the idea of my research is kind of has a trajectory to write in the first full-length biography of Winthrop Rockefeller. And the first fruits of that came out last year and were published uh, in a collection that looked, uh, an essay that looked at the 1966 election, that pivotal election that the panel last night we're talking about. Uh, and what I want to do today is to kind of spin my talk around three bits of political trivia. Uh, a lot of the discussion last night took up things that I would have said anyway, so that kind of moved the conversation along. So let me try and sort of expand the conversation that's already started and to maybe complicate a few of the uh, assumptions that we have about Rockefeller. First bit of trivia is um, we all know that one of the reasons we're here today is because it's the centennial year of Winthrop Rockefeller's birth. Less publicized is the fact that it's also the centennial of another governor's birth, uh, Sid McMath. Governor Sid McMath was also born in 1912. In fact, just about six weeks after Winthrop Rockefeller's birth on May 1st. And as Professor English mentioned last night, we should see, Rock uh, we should see McMath as part of that ongoing reform tradition in Arkansas. And Matt reform platform echoed, has many echoes in Rockefeller's platform, you know, the idea of political reform, the idea of industrialization, and the idea of racial reform as a precursor for those other things to take place. I think it's not just a happy circumstance that those two people, those two reformers, key reformer governors in Arkansas, were born at the same time. Because I think one of the things that we were talking about last night is the bipartisanship that exists in that time. It seems 
in many ways so alien to the current political culture in the United States. But I think a large role in that bipartisanship was played by the experiences of that generation of people, of the Rockefellers and McMass, who of course fought in the Second World War, both so active service. And the Second World War was a very transformative part of the South, of the United States on a macro level in terms of the economy and politics, but also had an important individual impact on the people who fought in it. For the first time, many Americans moved beyond their own states and beyond their own country and got a bigger perspective. Of course, we're also fighting in an ideological war in many ways against extreme right-wing totalitarian regimes in Germany, Japan, and Italy. So that reformist spirit, I think, and that bipartisanship that, that ascended beyond political parties is part of that wartime generation's experience. And that's, of course, reflected in the fact that General Eisenhower was elected president of the United States in the 1950s. And Eisenhower was approached by both the Democrats and the Republicans to be their presidential nominee. And I can't think of many figures today in 2012 who will be approached by both the Republicans and the Democrats to run as their presidential candidate. Uh, the second bit of political trivia spins on from that, and that is the 1964 Republican National Convention. 1964 Republican National Convention, the only time in American history, in American politics, that two members of the same family have been nominated for the same presidential ticket. One of them was Winthrop Rockefeller, who was nominated as a favorite son candidate from Arkansas's delegation. The other was his brother, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. And of course, it wasn't an antagonistic battle. Winthrop Rockefeller accepted and then passed the votes on to his brother Nelson. But Nelson Rockefeller was the great hope for the moderate wing of the Republican Party in 1964. And of course, in the 1950s, that moderate wing had been represented by President Eisenhower and had been dubbed Eisenhower Republicanism. In the 1960s, the Rockefeller family was sort of heirs to that political legacy. And Rockefeller Republicanism became a byword for the moderate wing of the Republican Party. But that 1964 Republican National Convention had far-reaching ramifications because ultimately Nelson Rockefeller was defeated for the candidacy by Barry Goldwater. And many historians and political commentators see that national convention as a definitive turning point in the history of the Republican Party. When the Republican Party at a national level turned its back on that moderate Eisenhower and Rockefeller republicanism and instead embarked upon a more right-wing lurch that went through the administrations of uh, Nixon and um, Reagan and the Bushes and beyond, and still profoundly shapes the Republican Party today. So I think part of that historical legacy, and one of the things we know about Rockefeller is his impact on the Democratic Party, I think Kathy is quite right to talk about that more ambiguous and interesting disjunction between what Rockefeller's legacy is to the Republican Party in Arkansas nationally and locally today, and that's kind of an interesting subject in its own right. And that takes me to my third piece of political trivia, um, and that's the election in 1966 in Arkansas. And it's kind of interesting that Rockefeller wins the election in 1966 here after the Republican Party has sort of rejected that moderate wing of the party. And Rockefeller's time in governor, one of the ways you can see it, I think, is the way that a Rockefeller Republicanism agenda may have worked if his brother Nelson had been elected in the Republican Party. And there are lots of things that have been written about the uh, 1966 election, but one of the fascinating statistics, I think, and revealing about that election is that up against Jim Johnson, who was a former president of the White Citizens Council, a defender of segregation, in the election, on white votes alone, Rockefeller lost the election. More white voters voted for Jim Johnson in 66 than voted for Winthrop Rockefeller. And whether it's more amazing that more white voters voted for a, white, uh, uh, a New York liberal, um, almost the majority of voters, or whether the majority of voters voted for Johnson as a former Citizens Council person is the most interesting and shocking. I don't know. We'll, we'll leave that to debate. But it's the first time in Arkansas history, certainly in 20th century history, that the African-American vote decided the election. 67,000 registered African-American voters made up the difference for Rockefeller on an African-American vote with a tie break and one office for Rockefeller, which is kind of interesting when you put that in the context of the National Republican Party at the time, which under Richard Nixon was developing its so-called Southern strategy, 
which was to cultivate those very people that Jim Johnson was trying to cultivate, the alienated white voters who thought that the civil rights movement had gone too far. So what you see in the late 60s, and Rockefeller in 68 increased his African-American vote, is a constituency for the local Republican Party, which is almost diametrically opposed to the constituency that the National Republican Party is trying to cultivate. And those kind of two interweaving strands, and Rockefeller was central both at the national convention and the local level, are part of the complex history of the Republican Party in Arkansas. And the Arkansas Republican Party, as we saw last night in that political debate, we know where Rockefeller stands with the Democrats and how he opened the road to democratic reform. His legacy in terms of the Republican Party and those different interweaving strands of local reform that he instituted and the national reforms that were taking place in the Republican Party have played out in very intriguing ways in the state. Although I think you know, we shouldn't overlook the impact that Rockefeller had in terms of the Republican Party here because at the same time he was elected in 1966, John Paul Hammerschmidt was also elected as Arkansas's first congressman, a Republican congressman in the 20th century. And the Republicans have held on to that congressional seat ever since. So there are direct continuities and links between Rockefeller Republicanism and Republicanism as it is today, but there are also important differences that changed along with the National Party and national reform in the Republican Party too. So I think that's an important strand to think about and untangle as we talk about political reform uh, in Arkansas and the wider nation today. And at that, I think my time's up. I'll pass on. Thank you, John. John Bro. Well, before I get ready to say what I intended to start to say, which is that Winthrop Rockefeller launched a near 50-year era in Arkansas politics that'll probably end in November, uh, let me say that I'm glad Sid McMath is getting his due. He did, in fact, begin many of the reforms, uh, attempt to launch many of the reforms, and could have launched an era himself, but for the fact that he was his term was succeeded eventually by the 12 years of Orville Faubus, who started out as kind of a descendant of Sid McMath, but who, as we know, in those 12 years, uh, disgraced the state and, uh, uh, lent and, and ruined any continuity to an era of reform that McMath otherwise would get credit for starting. That said, Winthrop Rockefeller in 1966 was a seminal transformational figure in Arkansas who launched an era of modernism, of true progress, and of true reform that has continued for nearly 50 years since that time with a few bumps along the way, but which I think, as a defined era, will end this year. I think Arkansas politics it's, it's, it's five decade uh, uh, essence as an era of progress, reform, and modernization is, that, that's peculiar to Arkansas is probably going to end this year with our politics becoming fully nationalized in that you can no longer transcend partisanship or national ideological orthodoxy and succeed on a peculiar Arkansas basis which has been the way Arkansas politics has functioned for the last 50 years. I loved the discussion last night of the uh, former governors, and I loved uh, 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 Ed Bethune uh, saying he was, you know, he was, he was one of us, he was a Republican, and I loved the Democrats saying, you know, particularly Jim Guy Tucker quoting some others, just saying he was almost a liberal Democrat. Everybody was trying to claim him. It was, it was it, it, and everybody can claim him because he was both of those. He was, uh, uh, Ed talking about how his essence was competition, two-party competition and greater political accountability. That's what the two-party system is supposed to be all about. That's what he fought for. But his policies were so progressive, so liberal, that he indeed can be claimed uh, 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 by natural heirs in the Democratic Party and is and was. But what he was, it, it, what, what he was transcends ideology. It transcends partisanship. He was, he was a fellow who came to Arkansas and sought bravely to modernize and launch an era of progress and to reform 
a poor, backward, racist, corrupt place. Otherwise, Arkansas was fine. But the, uh, <laughs> you, hear, you hear all this talk in, in contemporary politics about reform and change. That's what the whole political narrative is about. Uh, and it's all contrived anymore. That's what all negative advertising is about. It's about, I uh, am the good guy, and he's the bad guy. He's, he's the force of evil, I'm the white hat. This, this idea of reform, everybody wants it, but anymore it almost has to be contrived. It was real with Winthrop Rockefeller. The need for reform was absolutely basic and essential. And when you can capture that when it's real, and when it is embraced by the people of the state, then it does not matter whether you are on national issues, a liberal or a conservative, it did not matter whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. What he, the essence of his governorship transcended all of that. And naturally, it led then to heirs who were of the Democratic persuasion, but who were able to take that mantle of reform and progress and modernization and blow through the fact that most of them, his Democratic successors, most of them were liberals. I know Senator, uh, Governor and Senator Bumpers, I've heard him say since he's retired, I've heard him tell audiences, do you all know how you had a suspicion back in those days that I was more liberal than you? It's because I was. Uh, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter because the, the, our politics from 1966 until now has been about things that aren't strictly ideological, that aren't national. Trying to make this state more modern, bring it up to date, to attack its poverty, to attack its backwardness, to attack its educational failings. And none of that had to do with what party you were, and none of it uh, uh, had to do with what national ideological bent you brought to it. It simply did not matter. Now, when I say that era, beginning in 66, and, if, and now it's 2012, that's 46 years. Now, there have been a little, you know, no era is absolutely uh, uh, consistent. There were, there were some, some odd moments along the way in Arkansas. But even Mike Huckabee's 10 years. Uh, Mike Huckabee talked a good conservative game, but as a, as a policy guy and a budget guy, he was pretty centrist, left of center, in that same sort, and he sort of transcended ideology. I think right here on the 100th anniversary of Winthrop Rockefeller's birth, here as we have this conference about political reform, it is, I guess, ironic that in my view, that era of true reform, true progress, true modernization, transcending ideology, peculiar to the needs of Arkansas, is getting ready to end. Because I think politics anymore in Arkansas, and I think it'll, it was manifest in uh, 2010, well, I believe it will be manifest again in November, is now about national identification. We have 46 Republicans in the State House of Representatives, up from, what, 20 to 25 third, uh, uh, gain in, the, in 2010. Do you know how they got elected and what they came to the state capitol to do? They got elected by saying they were going to go to Little Rock and fight that Barack Obama and undo that health care reform. It was a national agenda. For the first, in a state that had always been since WR's time about our peculiar needs and our ability to address them on our own unique basis in a way that transcends ideology and partisanship, it was all about national issues. That con trend continues. It is my prediction that one or both of the houses of, uh, one or both the chambers of our state legislature will be uh, Republican next year, historic. And whether that's good or bad, you know, you know what I think, but uh, you know, uh, others, uh, you can think what you want about it. It is the launching of a different era. What we're here celebrating about Rockefeller, this, uh, the, the peculiarities of Arkansas politics and this wonderful spirit by which three Democratic successors can give us such wonderful, glowing tributes to, his le to a legacy of a Republican 
who launched their era. Now we're talking about Nancy Pelosi, Barack Obama, health care, stimulus, deficit, national issues. We are like the other southern states that went Republican from their natural conservatism over the last several decades. We're the last, I think, it is happening. Here's how, here's how it, uh, an example, and then I'll, 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 st I'll stop and we'll have more discussion. But if, you, if I had to pick a, a, an obvious successor in this lineage of go types of governors that we've had since Rockefeller, and he will be thrilled that I'm going to say this, uh, I would say that the young attorney general, Dustin McDaniel, would seem to be the next natural Air. He's of that mold. And I, I include uh, B.B. in that, too. He's a descendant of Clinton, Clinton of bumpers. And, you know, it, 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 it. McDaniel, if he runs for, uh, he is running for governor. He, if he is the nominee for the uh, Democratic Party, the Republicans will say he is an, if Obama's still president, big if, uh, he will say he will face criticism not, because he did not join the lawsuits by attorneys general around the country over health care reform. In other words, the natural descendant of this peculiar Arkansas uh, uh, culture, in which you can transcend the national issues and address our uh, and, and address us uh, on, on a purely local basis and finesse whatever. Na natural liberalism you have, which is what Jim Guy and Pryor and, and, uh, and, and Senator Bumpers did, he does not have that luxury because we are now more defined in Arkansas by the national issues. It's a remarkable, remarkable transformation. Uh, and it's amazing, really, to think that we're talking about a nearly 50-year era. Uh, launched by Rockefeller, and in a way launched, what, 48, 50, by Sid McMath, but then interrupted. So this is a big moment in Arkansas uh, in terms of our political definition. It's kind of, it could be kind of seminal. And it has been a very good era for the state. We produced a successful president of the United States. We got national attention for having uh, uh, these spectacularly talented politicians, and it all happened because of their skills, but because the kind of reform era that Winthrop Rockefeller introduced gave rise to that kind of politician who could finesse those kinds of ideologies uh, and make us a special and peculiar place. Sadly, in my view, we're changing now. Thank you all very much. Um, I want to kind of uh, ask a question, ask you all to grapple with something that, uh, that comes off of what John Brummett just said. He said you made the case that, that WR introduced a reform era. Um, and I would, uh, I would maybe challenge that a bit in that he came to a place in a time of, in which reform is happening elsewhere. Uh, there is a national reform underway, most obviously with the Civil Rights Movement, which is of course a national movement with a regional impact. But even in states without a Winthrop Rockefeller in the South, when we think about the changes to the way that balloting is done, to we, when we think about openness of meetings, some of the other reforms uh, that, uh, uh, that, that came to Arkansas. Um, prison issues being, sh light shined on them because of changes in the media and investigative journalism that is underway. How do we grapple with the intersection of this man and the times in which he came to be governor in Arkansas? I mean, did, does John Brummett have it right that he introduced it, or did he just ride a wave in a successful manner? Anybody can pop in. You want me to argue with myself? Uh, 
No, I, I, I think that, uh, yes, I mean, a big question is, if Rockefeller had not existed, would bumpers have existed? Would the New South have come to Arkansas anyway? I don't know. I guess so. But somebody said yesterday, if that race had gone the other way in 1966, Lord have mercy. Uh, I mean, seriously. I mean, I mean, yes, in the 60s, the nation is changing. But you all do know that Arkansas sometimes is behind the curve. <laughs> and if in 66, as, it, as would have been possible, if not for new campaign techniques and a lot of money, if Justice Jim Johnson had been the governor of Arkansas in 1966, there would have been no New South in Arkansas for a while. So it is true. Some of the basic reforms, the New South governors, which tended to be Democrats, which came with Carter and with bumpers, it was, it, was, it was happening, and reform was happening nationally in civil rights. I tend to think that Arkansas would have been a peculiar backward island, even amid that, if not for Rockefeller's victory in 66. Just my personal view. And, sorry, I'd, I'd agree with that as well. I think you know, Rockefeller acts as a catalyst that sets that in motion much earlier than it would have done otherwise. And that you know, it was important that a Republican was elected governor to allow the Democrats to have a period out of office to reform. I don't know if the Democrats could have reformed while in office, because if Johnson had won, they'd have said, we won't. So why, why change now? So I think it took that defeat and that realization that the Democrats weren't going to be in power forever and that they needed to rethink their strategy for going forward uh, that, that made a difference. And Rockefeller was the first Republican governor of Arkansas in 94 years. And that's a long time for Democrats to be in power. And it, I think, you know, that, that key catalyst point is the Democrats have to be out of power for that new young guard to take over the Democratic Party to get back in again. I think, so it's, it's, reform is happening, of course, you're right, but Rockefeller is an important catalyst that begins that, as John said earlier, than it otherwise would have been, I think. I agree. Um, you know, Sid McMath, the seeds were there in the Republican Party, I mean, in the Democratic Party, and Sid McMath might have been able to accomplish something had he not appointed Orville Faubus to the Highway Commission. But um, without the Democrats being forced out of power and the Faubus machine being forced to be split apart, no, it, it would have been much later. Um, I don't think it would have happened as quickly as it did. And they also, they needed the shock, not just of a Republican, but an outsider and the money he brought, not just in getting elected, but in the work he did in 64 and 65, registering voters and bringing college students in from out of state to register African American voters. I, I met a woman when I was doing research who had gone to Hendricks and was asked to help register voters in the Delta but her father lost his job because of it. And Rockefeller didn't want to ha that to happen, so he brought college students in from other states so that their families could not be financially intimidated because they were helping to register voters out in the Delta. The, both, I've heard a couple of references to, to money in politics. Um, and obviously, most of the most vibrant political reform movements of today uh, really center around money in politics. And I'm not, not so naive as to think that big money would have not come to Arkansas, but big money definitely came to Arkansas politics through Winthrop Rockefeller. And I think certainly, uh, and there was an up, upward trajectory across his campaigns, and obviously in the desperate moments of 1970, we see a mammoth spending spree by Governor Rockefeller in, in hopes of trying to save the office. Could y'all grapple a little bit with that aspect of his political career, which is so central to our conversations about uh, reforming politics today? I mean, to what degree does he get blamed for what happened? Uh, and in what ways did he change the mechanics of politics and the, 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 the financing of politics uh, through his campaigns? Well, the Republican, I mean, there was criticism of the spending from Republicans, too, because they, a lot of these old post office Republicans felt like he was trying to take over the party. Um, the Republican state party offices bounced back and forth between the tower building, which he owned, 
and another building because they didn't want his control. So it certainly was an issue at the time, and he was criticized for spending too much. He was criticized for getting his hair cut out of state. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I think money has always been a feature of politics, right, in Arkansas and everywhere else. And I, perhaps one of the things that Rockefeller does is change the culture from the money being in suitcases to being in bank accounts for politics. And that's, you know, that kind of reform is part and parcel of, you know, bringing the money issue above board, if you like, and into, into, the, into the light of day. But, you know, money changing hands, and you know, I think part central to all of this as well we, that we shouldn't overlook is the, the, the central role that race plays in all of this, in this reform, and which is tied to money as well, because, you know, poll taxes were paid for in the Delta, African-American voters and that kind of thing, and all that kind of thing went on. But the reform money governors, you know, saw race as crucial, racial change as crucial to change in the state and moving things on elsewhere. Math tried to take that on, and of course, Matt Math was the governor who, let, um, who finally allowed African Americans to vote in party elections. After a long time, you know, African Americans were barred from voting in the Democratic Party primaries, and even from being members of the Democratic Party. African Americans could only be members of the Democratic Party in Arkansas from 1950 onwards, after Matt Math presided over the convention where they were admitted as full members. Um, and that was central to Rockefeller too, and the kind of the missing link, I guess, of the Forbes years. And Forbes could have been an heir apparent of this progressive reform. You know, he was started in the Sidmat Math administration, was a fairly liberal politician in social terms. But, you know, he kind of went the other way on race. He decided that race would be the sacrifice to get liberal reforms passed through elsewhere. And Rockefeller and Math decided the other way. They decided that racial relations had to be tackled head on in order for the state to move forward in those other areas as well. So race is kind of pivotal in the way that those post-war politicians approach the idea of reform, and money is bound up with those delta votes in a lot of intrinsic ways as well. Uh, Jay, there's, there's almost no way to successfully deal with money in politics. I could really only think of one. Uh, uh, Citizens United is a disaster. What we're getting ready to see in the presidential race and the congressional races is going to be horrible. Public financing. You want to have uh, Jim Johnson versus Wynne Rockefeller with publicly financed limits? I don't. I want the good rich guy to spend all of his money to win. So that's not an ideal answer. But on the other hand, you don't want to celebrate wealth and give an advantage to wealth in politics. So it is simply insoluble. It, it, it is. But the best thing, the best circumstance, is for a good man, altruistic, with billions, to spend them to get elected in our state to do reform. That was the best way. That was the best way. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> that does not mean that I think today we should not have limits on those sorts of things. There's no solution. But in a, in a, in a difficult, uneasy world of money and politics. That's the nearest thing to an ideal I can think of. We have about 15, 20 minutes uh, left, and so um, I'd ask anyone to, to raise their hand, but then also come to the microphone. Uh, and uh, again, please identify yourself uh, as you begin your question, uh, and we'll try to get as many questions in as possible. Yes, sir. I don't need the microphone. I can talk loud enough. We need, we need you to use it so we can tape it. Okay. Is it on? He says it's on. I'm, I'm, on, I'm in lifelong Republican. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not be, I'll be brief. After hearing the opening last night, I have been flooded with memories of what I learned from Winthrop Rockefeller. Got up this morning about 4 o'clock, came over to get a paper, and there in the headline is an example of the effect of Winthrop Rockefeller's election. Headline, UA releases Petrino phone text messages 
under the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. That's a classical example of the effect of Winthrop Rockefeller's election. My name is Herb Rule, and I'd like to tag a question on to my friend Bob Scott's uh, comment. I agree with his comment. Um, to, as a prelude, let me confess that the second biggest contribution to my campaign in 1966 for the Arkansas legislature came from guess who? And we didn't know it at the time because you had these shadow bank accounts at Union National, but we later found out because we had some friends who were in the management at Union National Bank in downtown Little Rock, yes, Win Rockefeller. Now, that was in the Democratic primary. He did not, Marion, if you're still here, Marion, he did not, <laughs> and Marion engineered it, <laughs> I know. But, Marion, he did not contribute in the general election. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> now, you know, um, so here's the question. Uh, two questions. First of all, does anybody know Jim Johnson? Uh, would this group, went through, he's alive, and would the... Uh, the no, the, no, no. Oh, did he die? Yes. Just recently. Okay. Well... Uh, he deserves most of the vilification he gets. But uh, having known him and having played him three times in the Plasky County Bar Association Gridiron, he was also one of these uh, country populists from Ashley County. And um, it's hard. I know you're asked to project what might have happened and all this sort of thing. But anyway, the question is, um, why the pity party and the hagiolatry for W.R. because he did have the benefit of a almost half a turnover in the legislature, and he, which was a product of a parallel reform going on within the Democratic Party, anti fabas at the time. He did have the benefit of the uh, passage during his time, not only of the, the Freedom of Information Act, but of a score of additional legislation, including free textbooks, constitutional reform. All of this had to be passed by the legislature. And the legislature did pass it. And the, a new election code the Administrative Procedure Act. These are, sound a little bit arcane to those of you who are not lawyers, maybe, but they are most important progressive steps in the development of Arkansas law. Um, free kindergartens. That was a constitutional amendment. The kindergartens were. That, the Constitution had to be changed. But that was passed during the tenure of Rockefeller as he came into office. So I'm just curious. Uh, what it is about from the panel's perspective that leads us to kind of ignore the fact that it's a, we do have a, a state government and did have then a state government of uh, divided authority with executive and legislative and uh, uh, judicial branches uh, and to, to miss the nuance that these advances that occurred in the 67, 68, and 69 legislative sessions that were extremely significant were passed by legislatures, houses of the legislature, which were truly majority Democrat. But to me, it represents a parallel movement of reform that latched on to Rockefeller's leadership. And I don't denigrate him at all. He was a great guy and a great force for good in Arkansas. Thank you. So, so thoughts about what his legacy is in terms of the way that government operates, especially in terms of uh, the possibility of bipartisan well, work. Well, 
I would address that and to say that all of those reforms that you just listed took place in 67 and 68. That once Rockefeller got elected to a second term, the Democrats, no matter what they thought of his program, refused to pass it because they didn't because he was a Republican. They didn't want a Republican in um, the State House anymore. Mm -hmm. And that it, 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 there was a lot of partisanship. And, and while, yes, there was a lot of turnover in the legislature, they were still Democrats. And they were willing to give Rockefeller his term. They were willing to, to let him get credit for a lot of these reforms because they were happy to see the back end of Falbus. But that didn't mean they were willing to let a two-party system be created in the state of Arkansas. Uh, Herb, is, may, may I condense what you're saying to you, you? Rockefeller accomplished more actually with a reform, reforming democratic legislature than we have given him credit for by suggesting Democrats who came after enacted his program. Is that it? No. OK. Which, which is a constant refrain here at the Institute for many years that I've heard. Uh, he did do a lot, but legislative politics is always about getting an extra vote. And he had some guys in, in Marion and Tom Isley and a whole bunch of others that could help get the extra vote. And the legislatures in both 69 and, excuse me, 69 and 67 uh, did that. The, uh, the mixed drink bill was passed in 69. I'm sorry, you know, I disagree with the Professor Irwin that the 60, it was a smaller session, but it was no less, um, that's, that's the session that passed the minimum wage bill, was 69. Um, but we can talk about that later. But yes, John, I, that my, my sense was that, uh, of what we're talking about is that uh, legislative politics, that he was able to do this but he had a groundswell of 44 new members in the House, right. many of whom were. Uh, all I want to say about that is that nuance always gets in the way of the pretty big picture. <laughs> it, just, it, just all, it just always does. Uh, and there was great cultural uh, antipathy between Rockefeller and rural conservative Democratic legislators that hampered him. However, as you point out, there were successes. The two signature things, I think, we're raising the income tax and reorganizing government were the two things that the, the conventional wisdom becomes, well, that's what the conventional wisdom is, that, but that he could not do those, but bumpers could. Is that wrong also? Yes, I'm sorry. Well, well tell us, please. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've checked this recently. The Department of Administration was passed and approved by the legislature during the, those two sessions that he was government, governor. Um, as I said, the Administrative Procedure Act is a very significant uh, floor on the powers, the unbridled powers of state agencies. Uh, there were other things. We, uh, the legislature adopted a central telephone system under Governor Rockefeller, which was a bill that you guys sponsored, Marion. I mean, it was a it was an administration bill. The, the uh, legislature approved and passed a bill which first gave the first electronic data processing acquisition to state agencies and consolidated them. There was a great deal, despite, you know, everybody's saying that okay. da Dale did it. And, and Dale did, took it to the next level. Okay. But the Governmental Efficiency Study Commission which is what led to the legislation that was submitted and not entirely passed that, uh, that recommended consolidation and reorganization of state government was passed in 67 or 69. So these things don't happen, I mean, you know, they don't really happen overnight. It was a pretty significant thing and it took a lot of political uh, effort. And these guys were there helping and, but the, the strengths of it was that there was help within the legislature because the record shows that he did have productive sessions 
both in 67 and 69, to my way of thinking. Thank you. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Oh, I just have to hold it closer. Um, my question is more focused on what Mr. Brummett was uh, talking about, the end of the pragmatic political reform era. Um, it, do you think that the, the uh, end of the era has more to do with o President Obama personally, or do you think it has more to do with the phenomenon of the new media bringing information and the national issues uh, into people's homes with, with the emails and things like that, or do you think it has more to do with a, a president personally and his politics and policies? Hmm. Do I, uh, I believe it has everything to do with both. <laughs> well, I do. I'm, uh, uh, Ar this has, Arkansas has been Alabama waiting to happen, uh, uh, basically, for, for some time. But we have, we have held it off by uh, 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 this, this era in which we were able to separate ourselves from the national politicians. That's not happening now because, well, had Dukakis been elected president, it would have happened. Had Mondale been elected president, it would have happened. It didn't happen with Carter because he had sort of a Southern brotherhood. It didn't happen with Bill Clinton, for heaven's sakes. He was our favorite son. It was going to happen. It's happened because it was inevitable. It's happened because it's personal toward Obama. It has, has it's, it's th this refrain that I used to be a Democrat, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, it left me. That's been bubbling in Arkansas and it has just come to the top. It is exacerbated by the fact that we are a newly misinformed society. Not a newly informed society, but a newly mis, we got all of our partisan news now which makes all of these divides even more stark and more destructive, I think. That is why uh, I, think, I, think, I think it's not an either or, it is a dynamic combination of the two factors you cite. And I, I would also ask, add the kind of national interest groups uh, who, right. who are now consciously uh, focused on state legislative activity um, and, and mostly on the right uh, with with Alec and Fair working on immigration issues. And, yeah, you're going to. That's, that's, I think that's an important part of the story as well. And, and I'm not, I don't mean to be uh, pejorative or be partisan about this, even though of course I am, but, but uh, uh, the, uh, the Citizens United and the, and, the, and the super PACs, we're thinking about that in the swing states and the presidential race and congressional race. We may see that in Arkansas legislative races. We may see a whole lot of unaccounted high sums of money to push this Republican takeover in our state legislature this year. So it's all of that. It's, it's, uh, these things don't happen from one thing. Explosions happen from combinations. And that's what we're having. Would one one last Mr. question. Mr. Nash back there. Thank you. My name is Bob Nash, <clears throat> and I'm with James Lee Whit Associates here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I just want to say a couple words about the impact that went to Rockefeller had on my life and people like me all over the state. The first time I heard about a, a governor, or read about a governor, it was Orville Faubus. And it made me feel like a third or fourth class citizen, as it did many of my friends. A lot of them left the state. I stayed because I probably couldn't afford to leave. When the Rockefeller became governor, I saw him at in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where he said just the opposite of Orville Faubus. I care about you, I want you to get educated, I respect this institution. That made me feel very good, and I said, I'm gonna stay here. Sonny Walker said, Winter Rockefeller cares about giving African Americans an equal opportunity to work. My father said, That's, that'll never happen. I applied for a job with the Employment Security Division under a woman named Leona Troxwell. Someone mentioned Troxwell, Troxwell, and got a job. I got the job because Sonny Walker said, Governor Rockefeller had said, you got to hire, you cannot have an institution with all white men and not many white women either in these institutions. So I stayed. That led to my having an opportunity to work in the prior administration when he was governor, the Bumpers administration, the Clinton administration, and there are so many African Americans 
who in this state who stayed here because of that, that you'll never hear from. But I'm here today, today to tell you that that's what happened to me. Going from not being able to eat in the cafeteria of the state capitol in 1965 to working in the governor's office in 1983. This is, this is the kind of impact that he had. And then the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, where I had an opportunity to work with Marion and Max Milam and Bob Schultz and other people, actually laid the groundwork for many of the ideas that Bill Clinton, that we implemented when he was governor. He liked the things that the progressive, forward-thinking Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation that was endowed by Winthrop Rockefeller was doing. And that's what we were doing. So I'm, I just want to tell you here today that there are so many stories like this that will never come out. I hope they do one day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments and questions, but let's also thank our panelists uh, one last time as well. There